Hey guys, in this video, I'm going to take a look at the history and details behind every single Alice in Chains record from the Lane Staley era. This includes both the full-length records and the EPs. Before I continue, I want to mention that I think the William Duvall era of Alice in Chains is also great. There are some songs from the William era that I really enjoy, and I think in general, William deserves credit for the job he's done with Alice in Chains over the years. Hey guys, my name's Daniel. If you're new to my channel and you like Alice in Chains, grunge, and rock music in general, make sure to subscribe because there's a lot more to come. Everything I do is totally self-funded, self-produced, and self-researched, so if you guys want to support, in all sincerity, your subscription does go a long way. Now, without further ado, let's get into it. We Die Young is the title of Alice in Chains' debut EP. There are three songs on the EP, including the title track, We Die Young, It Ain't Like That, and Killing Yourself. The EP clocks in at 10 minutes and 8 seconds and was released by Alice in Chains label Columbia in July of 1990. Alice in Chains' debut full-length record, Facelift, was released shortly after on August 21st, 1990. Because of the close proximity of the releases, sometimes Facelift is mistakenly thought of as Alice in Chains' first major label release, when in reality, Alice in Chains' first major label release is the We Die Young EP. Part of the confusion also comes from the fact that the song We Die Young was also included on Facelift, and that the song We Die Young is the first single from Facelift. As a matter of fact, We Die Young is Alice in Chains' first ever single. In terms of the meaning behind the song We Die Young, Jerry Cantrell has stated the following. I just temporarily moved in with Susan Silver because Sean Kinney and I had just had a fight. So I was riding the bus to rehearsal and I saw all these 9, 10, 11 year old kids with beepers dealing drugs. The sight of a 10 year old kid with a beeper and a cell phone dealing drugs equaled We Die Young to me. This statement by Jerry Cantrell was from 1999. In 1991, Lane Staley offered a different explanation of what the song is about. We Die Young is about gang violence. That was something that happened in Seattle, something that kind of opened our eyes. It just seemed like things were getting out of hand. Incidents where kids were getting shot and getting their tennis shoes ripped off their dead bodies. It just seems like these kids are dying at younger and younger ages and getting involved in gang activity. The We Die Young title track comes in at 2 minutes and 31 seconds and remains one of Alice in Chains' most popular songs. The music video is visually very attention grabbing, the saturation and color contrast at various points throughout the video are turned up very high and there are multiple shots where people are struggling to get out of goo-like water trying not to drown. The goo-like water is supposed to be blood. Rocky Shank directed the music video, the same person who directed the music videos for other Alice in Chains songs including Them Bones and Grind. In addition to the color contrasting and the pool of blood we see in We Die Young's music video, the video also features a lot of headbanging. The guys in Alice in Chains arguably had the coolest hair of all the grunge bands. Now, interestingly, there is a second official music video for We Die Young. This alternate music video was directed by the Art Institute of Seattle. And as a matter of fact, this is the first music video for the song. The Rocky Shank version by The Pool is actually the second version. The first version by the Art Institute of Seattle is essentially a live performance video of Alice in Chains playing We Die Young. At the time of the EP's release, the title track We Die Young became a hit on metal radio, which is partly what prompted Alice in Chains label Columbia to get their debut record out quickly, hence Facelift's release in close proximity to the We Die Young EP. The We Die Young EP was released as a promo-only EP on vinyl and cassette, and so even to this day it's considered a collector's item. The EP was recorded at London Bridge Studios in Seattle and was produced by Dave Jordan. A demo version of We Die Young was released on 1999's Nothing Safe Best of the Box set. That demo version is also available on Alice in Chains' YouTube channel. Alice in Chains' lineup at this time consisted of Lane Staley, Jerry Cantrell, Mike Starr, and Sean Kinney, the band's original lineup. This is the lineup which appears on Alice in Chains' first two full-length studio records, Facelift from 1990 and Dirt from 1992, as well as the band's second EP, Sap, which was also released in 1992. Facelift is Alice in Chains' debut full-length record and is rightfully considered one of the most iconic grunge albums of all time. Though it's more than just a grunge record, many would argue it's actually more of a hard rock metal album. Of all the grunge bands out there, Alice in Chains is definitely one of the heaviest. Facelift was released on August 21st, 1990, shortly after the band's We Die Young EP was released in July of 1990. The title track from the EP, We Die Young, also appears on Facelift, and as a matter of fact, the debut single from Facelift is We Die Young. Thus, there has been a bit of confusion at times regarding this. Some people believe that the song We Die Young originally appeared on Facelift when, in reality, it was released one month earlier as part of the We Die Young EP. 
As is the case with much of Alice in Chains' music, several of the songs on Facelift deal with personal subject matter. In April of 1987, Jerry Cantrell's mother, Gloria, passed away from cancer. She was only 43 at the time. Jerry Cantrell was 21 at the time of his mother's death, and it affected him deeply. The song Sunshine on Facelift is about the death of his mother. As a matter of fact, Facelift is dedicated to the memory of Jerry Cantrell's mother. In January of 1991, a few months after the release of Facelift, Jerry told the following to Spin Magazine. When I was a little kid, I'd always tell her, I'll be famous and buy you a house and you'll never have to work again. I'll take care of you like you took care of me. When she passed away, I didn't know how to deal with it, and I still don't. But it gave me the impetus to do what I'm doing. Thematically, Facelift deals with heavy subject matter such as death and depression. According to Jerry Cantrell, the album was intended to have a, quote, moody aura, a direct result of the brooding atmosphere and feel of Seattle. As mentioned, Facelift was released on August 21st, 1990. About a year later, on September 11th, 1991, the record was certified gold, becoming the first record from the grunge movement to be certified gold. The album itself was recorded from parts of December 1989 to April of 1990 at London Bridge Studios in Seattle and at Capitol Recording Studio in Los Angeles. And in terms of the actual recording of the record, Alice in Chains drummer Sean Kinney stated that he had recorded the album with a broken hand. I almost didn't play on the record. They started rehearsing with the drummer from Mother Love Bone, Greg Gilmore. I was sitting there playing with one hand, guiding him through it. Dave Jordan, Faceless producer, came in and they started to try to do it. He was like, screw it, pull the plug, this is not going to be the same. Luckily, we took a tiny bit of time off. I had that cast on for a while and was like, I can't miss this. I cut my cast off in the studio and kept a bucket of ice by the drum set, kept my hand iced down, and played with a broken hand. In addition to the music, the cover art for Facelift is also one of the iconic images in grunge. Part of what makes this image iconic is the fact that the person in the photo is actually Alice in Chains bass player Mike Starr. Rocky Shank, the man who directed many of Alice in Chains music videos, also did photography for Facelift. Rocky Shank did lots of experimental photography, and the band was impressed by some of his work. In particular, the band admired Rocky's portraits of the sordid faces and wanted him to do something similar for the album cover of Facelift. He took portraits of each of the band members, and ultimately, one of the photos of Mike Starr was chosen as the cover for Facelift. As a matter of fact, Alice in Chains decided to name the record Facelift after seeing how unnatural and distorted Mike Starr's face looked in that photo. Jerry Cantrell has said that the original idea for the album cover was an embryonic type thing which would represent the birth of the band, so to speak. But the distorted, unnatural looking image of Mike Starr's face was darker and fit well with the dark themes of the music. In addition to the studio recording of the album, the band also released a compilation record called Live Facelift, a concert video and live album featuring the band performing some of the songs off of the record at the Moore Theatre in Seattle. The Moore Theatre is an important location in the story of grunge in general. I made a video about Nirvana's history with the Moore Theatre. If you'd like to see that video, the link is available in the description box below. The record which brought grunge to the widespread mainstream consciousness was Nevermind, which was released on September 24th, 1991, and went gold on November 27th, 1991. But as mentioned, Facelift was the first grunge record to go gold, officially achieving the feat on September 11th, 91. As iconic of a record that Facelift is, however, it was not a major success right off the bat. It sold less than 40,000 copies in the first six months after its release. Now, 40,000 copies is still a very respectable number, but for a major label release, it's not exactly up there. It was only after MTV added the music video for Man in the Box into its regular daytime rotation that the album began to take off, eventually selling 400,000 copies in six weeks, compared to 40,000 copies in six months. I did an interview with JJ French from Twisted Sister a little while back where he discussed the impact Alice in Chains had on MTV. It's common knowledge that Nirvana was the band that really put the final nail in the coffin in terms of glam metal's mainstream popularity, but in this interview, JJ makes the point that Alice in Chains was the band that first got MTV to steer away from glam metal towards grunge. Here's a clip from that interview. MTV changed dramatically. So a friend of mine was an executive at MTV. So I called her and I asked her what happened. Because I, was it the equivalent of the dinosaur, you know, of the meteor hitting you know, the world and wiping out the dinosaur. And she said that um, you, they would sit down every Tuesday to watch videos, you know, the new videos. And, um, you know, like all these little hair bands were like little jets on a runway, you know, the next, the Atlantic jet, the Columbia jet, the Geffen jet. The, the turning point was a video called Man in the Box by Alice in Chains that totally shifted their focus away from, quote, hair bands that had dominated MTV and made Twisted Sister, Twisted Sister, or we made them. But, uh, you know, that was 84 for us. 
So here we are in 91. So I had a good run, six years, seven years, and then Man in the Box comes out and they look at it and they had a choice to add Man in the Box or a video by a group called Thunder that was your typical product, typical heavy metal band, hair that did all the things that hair is supposed to do and all this shit. And they were on Geffen and that was the next hyped band coming and they looked at Thunder and they looked at Man in the Box. So Alice Jane and went, uh-uh, we're taking that. And that was a road less traveled and it wiped out the dinosaur, which was the hair metal bands. And it kind of ended. The only band that leapfrogged and saved themselves was Guns N' Roses. And my theory is that Guns N' Roses was um, not perceived as a joke. They came out of L.A., but I think that Axel, first of all, had a great voice. Uh, uh, um, uh, I think that they were perceived as real, not fake, like really like they were real junkies, not pretend junkies. So there's a authenticity is all about authenticity and grunge is all about authenticity. People wanted authenticity. So they got it with grunge and it wiped out the um, the perceived frivolousness of hair metal. Which is, hey, man, let's party. Let's get the girls and drink and, you know, like, uh. I think people just got sick of that and they wanted authentic. You know, that's what I think. Anyway. But you, you don't like the term hair metal, you said, right? No, I think it's a derogatory term. I use it because it makes it easy for someone to, I could say 80s metal, you know, 80s metal. Not here. But yeah, it's a derogatory term. You know, I mean, it's acid rock or derogatory, folk rock. I mean, everyone comes up with a, with a, with a you know, let's label it. It's skinny tie, it's new wave, it's new wave of British heavy metal. The press always has to like do it. Let's just say that American um, American 80s metal is pretty much of a type. It's of a type. It looks the same. It sounds the same. It is the same to a non to a non fan. You know, my father used to say that everything sucked after 1945. Like, all music sucked. Like, he, he made it really simple. 1945, before, after. Before, great. After, sucked. I said, how do you just dismiss 50 years? He goes, it's so easy. It's just baby, baby, baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all it is. So if you don't care enough to know, you don't know, right? So if you don't care enough to know and you're a casual observer of MTV, you wouldn't know the difference in Warrant. Uh, poison, white snake. It's all the same, right? It's all the same. But you wouldn't know the difference in 1964 if you didn't care enough to know the difference in the Beatles, Billy J. Kramer and the Dakotas, Jerry and the Pacemakers, Freddie and the Dreamers. If you didn't know and you just heard the songs on the radio and showed pictures, you'd, you'd all go, it's all the same. It's all the same. You know, this is the problem with genre, with genres as the genres move forward. You know, it's all the same. And Motown, you know, same guys playing on every track. You could dismiss it as all the same. I would never do it because I know Motown. So I could tell you the difference in every singer going. But if you don't care, it all sounds the same. If you don't care about Liverpool, it all sounds the same. If you don't care about 80s metal, it's all the same. If you don't care about grunge, it's all the same. That's the problem with and country music. You know, if you don't care about country, it's all the same. What does Alan Jackson say about country music? You play a country record backwards, the girl comes back, the car comes back, and the dog comes back, you know? And that's a country guy making a joke about country. You know, I don't know what you say about an 80s metal, you know? Party dude. That's what it should just be called, party dude, right? It's everything's party dude. Facelift clocks in at 54 minutes and 2 seconds, featuring a total of 12 songs. We Die Young, Man in the Box, Sea of Sorrow, Bleed the Freak, I Can't Remember, Love, Hate, Love, It Ain't Like That, Sunshine, Put You Down, Confusion, I Know Something About You, and Real Thing. Sap is Alice in Chains' second studio EP and the third major label release from the band, the first two being the We Die Young EP and Facelift. Sap was released on February 4th, 1992, and is notable for a variety of reasons. Unlike their previous two releases and their next release, Dirt, the Sap EP is mostly an acoustic record. Sap tracks in at 20 minutes and 49 seconds, featuring five songs, Brother, Got Me Wrong, Right Turn, Am I Inside, and a hidden track, Love Song. Of these five songs, Brother is particularly noteworthy because Brother marks the very first time where Jerry Cantrell sings lead vocals on an officially released Alice in Chains song. 
As a matter of fact, Lane Staley encouraged Jerry Cantrell to sing lead vocals on Brother. The two of them both sing on that song. Another unique thing about this EP is that there are many notable guest singers on the record. Ann Wilson from Heart, Chris Cornell from Soundgarden, and Mark Arm from Mudhoney. As a matter of fact, Chris Cornell and Mark Arm both appear on the same song, Right Turn. Jerry Cantrell, Lane Staley, Chris Cornell, and Mark Arm all sing on that one song. As an homage to their band names, Alice in Chains, Soundgarden, and Mudhoney, they called themselves Alice Mudgarden. Alice Mudgarden actually became a short-lived side project. Going back to Alice in Chains, with regards to the love song, the hidden track on the SAP EP, Jerry Cantrell described that song as, quote, the most bizarre song we've ever recorded. Members of the band all switched their instruments for the recording of that song. Lane Staley played drums, Jerry Cantrell played bass, Sean Keeney played piano, and Mike Starr played guitar. It was Sean Keeney's idea to get everyone to switch around their instruments. Despite the title of the track, Love Song, which at first glance may give off the impression it would be a softer song, Love Song is actually the heaviest song on the record, and its lyrics are anything but sweet and loving. The song was definitely made with a strong sense of sarcasm. As mentioned, the EP was released on February 4th, 1992. By January 14th, 1994, it had sold more than 500,000 copies and was certified gold. One of the notable things about this is that when the album was released, the band just had copies of the record put out in stores without any promotion or advertising. In Jerry Cantrell's words, the band released Sap, quote, without any fuss or fanfare so as the real Alice fans could find it, end quote. The EP was recorded a few months before its release in November of 1991 at London Bridge Studios in Seattle with producer Rick Parasher. After Alice in Chains' facelift tour, the band had planned on recording Wood as part of the soundtrack for the movie's singles. While they were in the studio, however, they decided to take advantage of that opportunity, and they ended up demoing multiple songs. In Jerry Cantrell's words, In the session that was meant for the recording of that one song, Wood, we ended up demoing about 10 songs, which included all the stuff that ended up on the Sap EP, Rooster, and a couple of others from Dirt. The version of Rooster that was recorded during the SAP EP sessions was eventually released in 1999 as part of Alice in Chains' Music Bank box set. The band, however, did consider including that original version of Rooster on the SAP EP itself, but ultimately decided to save the song for their next full-length record, Dirt. The version of Rooster which appears on Dirt is not the version from the SAP EP sessions. The band re-recorded Rooster for the Dirt album. So, in other words, the version of Rooster which is famous is actually not the original studio recording of the song. Now, in terms of why the EP is called SAP, as the story goes, while the band were in the studio, Shot Kinney, Alice in Chains' drummer, had a dream about making an EP called SAP. The band went with it, and that's how the album was named. Keeping in character with Alice in Chains' other albums, the subject matter on much of SAP is very personal. With regards to the song Brother, Jerry Cantrell has said that the song is about his relationship with his younger brother, and in particular, it's about the point in Jerry's life after his parents divorced and his younger brother lived with his father while he lived with his mother. Jerry has said that the song, quote, was a way of trying to build a bridge, end quote. Got Me Wrong is another song about personal relationships. In Jerry Cantrell's words, the song is about a relationship where one partner thinks he or she can change the other person. Now, interestingly, Sap was actually re-released on March 21st, 1995, more than three years after its original release on February 4th, 1992. It was re-released because one of the songs from the EP, Got Me Wrong, grew significantly in popularity after it was included on the soundtrack for the 1994 movie Clerks. In 1996, during Alice in Chains' MTV Unplugged performance, Brother and Got Me Wrong, both from the SAP EP, were included in their set. Considering that at the time of SAP's release, Alice in Chains were still a relatively new band, to me it shows a sense of bravery from the band that they put out this EP. I say this because coming off of the success of Facelift, which sonically is a very heavy record, it would have been reasonable to think that Alice in Chains' next release would have been a similar sounding record to Facelift. Typically, that's what happens in the music industry. When an artist has a successful release, their next release usually sounds very similar, especially if it's a relatively new band that doesn't have a big discography to begin with. Despite this, however, Alice in Chains went in a different direction with Sap, which to me not only shows a sense of bravery from the band, but also a sense of artistic integrity in that they wrote the music they wanted to write, not necessarily what was expected from them to write. All in all, the Sap EP holds a unique place in Alice in Chains' discography. Now, I want to show you guys a clip from my interview with Jonathan Plum, an engineer who worked with Alice in Chains during various sessions, including part of the Sap sessions. In this clip, he shares some memories of Lane Staley from the Sap sessions. A really big impression on me of working with Alice was we were working on SAP 
and staff was filled with a lot of more ballads. Because I knew Alice and Chains from um, Facelift, which was the rock record. Yeah. And so they're back here doing SAP. And a lot of the songs, the first few songs I worked on with them were uh, more the ballads. And I remember he was, we were having to do a lot of takes over and over. And I remember asking Rick, again, Rick Brosh was producing these sessions. And I remember asking Rick, like, wow, it, it takes him a lot of work to get these takes. And he's not even like shouting. He's singing softly. And, and Rick's like, yeah, he... Singing softer is, is actually harder, typically, for singers. And to the, the screaming, the belting thing, like, that's where Lane lives. Like, that's really easy for him. We usually get that in one take. It's the singing soft part that takes a little more time. So at that point, I hadn't heard Lane scream, you know, like his typical scream, but I really was excited to. And I don't know that we ever actually did any screaming vocals. I guess later we did, actually. But on the sap, the, where I sap, when I came in, sap was already mostly done. We were just finishing it up. But I remember... Lane again was in the vocal booth and he walked in the control room and he was frustrated because he couldn't sing and he just yelled, he used to yell fuck at the top of his lungs. But it was like, it was that Lane yell. And that was the first moment I heard <laughs> Lane's voice, just not on mic, him just being frustrated, going fuck. And I was like, whoa, that's the voice. There <laughs> you should have recorded that, man. That yeah, would be awesome. Yeah, yeah. So that really, it just shook me, you know, it like rattled me to hear that voice in, in person in front of my face. and. You know, and I was, I just love, I'm a huge Lane Staley fan. I just love his voice so much. So yeah. I'll, I'll always remember that moment. They would come and use the studio for uh, long, long hours and, and really get to work. And I, I remember being really nervous around, around those guys because of how intense they worked. Mm. Um, I kind of felt like com compared to Pearl Jam, when, when Alice came in, it was just music work. There wasn't a lot of downtime. So I remember being having to really be on my ball as, a, as an engineer. So yeah, my relationship with Alice in Chains, kind of the same thing with Pearl Jam is that I, I was already, in fact, I had heard, I had known of Alice in Chains longer than Pearl Jam and I was a really huge fan of Alice in Chains as well. Dirt is Alice in Chains' second full-length studio album, and it's considered by many as the quintessential Alice in Chains record. It was released on September 29, 1992, and features some of Alice in Chains' most iconic songs, including Wood, Rooster, and Down in a Hole. Though all of Alice in Chains' albums deal with heavy and personal subject matter, Dirt is particularly dark thematically. Jerry Cantrell has said the following about the record. We did a lot of soul searching on this album. There's a lot of intense feelings. We deal with our daily demons through music. All of that poison that builds up during the day, we cleanse when we play. Drug addiction was a problem the band was dealing with at the time, and many of the lyrics on Dirt reflect that. Lane Staley has said he actually regrets having written as much as he did about drug usage because, in retrospect, he felt his music was misinterpreted as condoning drug use. I wrote about drugs, and I didn't think I was being unsafe or careless by writing about them. I didn't want my fans to think that heroin was cool. But then, I've had fans come up to me and give me the thumbs up, telling me they're high. That's exactly what I didn't want to happen. Drug addiction, unfortunately, was a widespread issue within the grunge scene. One of the most famous deaths which resulted from a drug overdose was the death of Andrew Wood, the lead singer of Malfunction and Mother Love Bone. Andrew Wood was well-liked in the grunge scene and was friends with Jerry Cantrell. The first single from Dirt, Wood, was written by Jerry Cantrell as a tribute to Andrew Wood. During the early 90s, there were several tributes by grunge artists in honor of the late Mother Love Bone singer, a prime example being Temple of the Dog, which was conceived by Chris Cornell as an Andrew Wood tribute. Going back to Alice in Chains and the theme of drug addiction prevalent throughout Dirt, Jerry Cantrell stated the following, With Dirt, it's not like we were saying, Oh yeah, this is a good thing. It was more of a warning than anything else, rather than, Hey, come and check this out, it's great. We were talking about what was going on at the time, but within that, there was always a survivor element, a kind of triumph over the darker elements of being a human being. In addition to the theme of drug addiction that was prevalent in many of the songs on Dirt, another subject matter explored on this record was war. Rooster is one of Alice in Chains' most recognizable songs. The song was written by Jerry Cantrell about his father, Jerry Cantrell Sr., who served in the U.S. military during the Vietnam War. Rooster was a nickname Jerry Cantrell Sr. had had since the time he was a kid. Jerry's great-grandfather gave his dad the nickname Rooster because he felt he had a cocky attitude and the hair on top of his head used to stick up like a rooster's comb. Rooster was also a nickname given to U.S. soldiers in Vietnam who used M60 machine guns because the muzzle flash looked like a rooster's tail. Jerry Cantrell wrote the song in 1991 while he was living at Chris Cornell's and Susan Silver's house in Seattle. 
Jerry Cantrell Sr.'s psychological scars from the Vietnam War contributed to the breakdown of their family. Jerry wrote the song from the perspective of his father. In 1992, he said the following to the magazine Guitar for the Practicing Musician. He's heard the song. He's only seen us play once, and I played this song for him when we were in this club opening for Iggy Pop. I'll never forget it. He was standing in the back and he heard all the words and stuff. Of course, I was never in Vietnam and he won't talk about it. But when I wrote this, it felt right. Like these were things he might have felt or thought. And I remember when we played it, he was back by the soundboard and I could see him. He was back there with his big gray Stetson and his cowboy boots. He's a total Oklahoma man. And at the end, he took off his hat and just held it in the air. And he was crying the whole time. This song means a lot to me. A lot. Down in a Hole is another song on the record that is deeply personal for Jerry Cantrell. Down in a Hole is in my top three personally. It's to my longtime love. It's the reality of my life, the path I've chosen, and in a weird way, it kind of foretold where we are right now. It's hard for us both to understand that this life is not conductive to much success with long-term relationships. Death is another theme explored on Dirt, a prime example of that being the song Them Bones. Them Bones is pretty cut and dried. It's a little sarcastic, but it's pretty much about dealing with your mortality and life. Everybody's going to die someday. Instead of being afraid of it, that's the way it is. So enjoy the time you've got. As mentioned off the top, Dirt is a darker record than Facelift. In particular, both records deal with the theme of death, but Dirt dives into that subject a bit deeper. One of the songs on Dirt that deals with death is Them Bones. An iconic moment from that song is when Lane Staley screams, ah, over Jerry Gontral's guitar riff. According to the engineer Brian Carlstrom, that scream was actually improvised. Lane Staley came up with the idea to add that scream to the song while he was in the studio. Another interesting thing about Dirt is that it actually features some guitar work from Lane Staley. Lane Staley plays rhythm guitar on two of the songs on the record, those songs being Hate to Feel and Angry Chair, the 11th and 12th tracks on the record. Not only does Lane Staley play rhythm guitar on Hate to Feel and Angry Chair, he wrote both of those songs. Those are two of the songs on Dirt where Lane Staley is the only credited songwriter. In total, there were 13 songs on Dirt, though at least 15 songs were known to have been recorded. The two songs recorded during the Dirt sessions that weren't included on the record were Fear the Voices and Lying Seasons. In 1999, both of those songs were included on Alice in Chains' box set Music Bank, and as a matter of fact, the only single released from the box set was Fear the Voices. The album was recorded at various points between April to July of 1992 at three different recording studios, London Bridge Studio in Seattle, as well as El Dorado Recording Studios and one-on-one -on -one recording studios both in Los Angeles. The record was produced by Dave Jordan and Alice in Chains, with Rick Parasher being the producer on Wood. Wood was actually recorded before the official sessions for Dirt took place. It was recorded initially for the soundtrack to the 1992 movie, Singles. Dirt would be the final record to feature Alice in Chains' original lineup of Lane Staley, Jerry Cantrell, Sean Kinney, and Mike Starr, who was fired from the band in January of 1993 and subsequently replaced by Mike Inez. In an article which appeared in Rolling Stone magazine in February of 94, Lane Staley said that Mike Starr's exit from the band was a result of, quote, just a difference in priorities. We wanted to continue intense touring and press. Mike was ready to go home. Mike Starr later came forth and gave a different view of things, stating he was kicked out of the band due to his escalating drug addiction. Tragically, years later, on March 8, 2011, Mike Starr died from a prescription drug overdose. Drug addiction, death, depression, and other heavy subjects were explored throughout Dirt. As such, it made sense that the album cover for Dirt would also be somewhat dark. The album cover features the image of a woman half buried in a barren desert. It's unclear whether she's alive or dead. It's been speculated that the woman on the album cover was Lane Staley's girlfriend at the time, Demri Perrot. But Rocky Shank, the photographer of the album cover, later revealed that the girl on the cover is actually Mariah O'Brien, a former model and actress. The cover of Dirt is actually referenced in one of Alice in Chains' music videos from their fourth record, Black is Way to Blue. In the music video for one of the singles from that record, the song A Looking in View, a woman is lying down on a cracked dirt desert floor. This happens around the 6.53 mark of the video. As a matter of fact, the record Black is Way to Blue was released on September 29, 2009, exactly 17 years to the day Dirt was released on September 29, 1992. When Dirt was released in 92, it received praise from both fans and critics alike. As mentioned, Dave Jordan produced Dirt. As a matter of fact, he produced Alice in Chains' first two full-length records, Facelift and Dirt. Facelift was recorded between December of 89 to April of 1990, and Dirt was recorded between April to July of 1992. 
In an interview with Music Radar, Dave made an interesting comment about how the mood with the band was different during the Dirt sessions in comparison to the facelift sessions. They were hot and ready to go during the facelift sessions. They did some drinking, but there were no drugs. By the Dirt sessions, they were a big established band and the vibe was different. They were getting jaded. Lane told me he didn't like being famous. He told me flat out, people look at you like you're a piece of merchandise. In addition to being an iconic grunge record, Dirt is considered by many as an iconic metal record as well. In 2011, Joe Robinson from Loudwire named Dirt one of the best metal albums of the 90s, and in 2017, Dirt was listed as number 26 on Rolling Stone's list of the 100 greatest metal albums of all time. It was also listed as number 6 in Rolling Stone's 2019 list of the 50 greatest grunge albums. Dirt had a total of 5 singles, Wood, Them Bones, Angry Chair, Rooster, and Down in a Hole, and it had 12 songs in total. Five singles were released from Dirt, Wood, Them Bones, Angry Chair, Rooster, and Down in a Hole. In total, there are 13 songs on Dirt. Them Bones, Damn That River, Rain When I Die, Down in a Hole, Sick Man, Rooster, Junkhead, Dirt, Godsmack, Intro Slash Iron Gland, Hate the Feel, Angry Chair, and Wood. Jar of Flies is Alice in Chains' third studio EP. It was recorded over the course of one week from September 7th to 14th, 1993 at London Bridge Studios in Seattle, and was released on January 25th, 94. Much like their previous EP, Sap, Jar of Flies features a lot of acoustic work, though there are some heavier songs on the record including I Stay Away, which was actually nominated for the Grammy for Best Hard Rock Performance. The EP was also nominated for the Grammy for Best Recording Package, which essentially is the Grammy for Best Artwork. Jar of Flies was the first record the band recorded after Dirt. Now, despite the fact that Dirt was a major success, the band actually found themselves homeless when they returned to Seattle from the 93 Lollapalooza tour. They had been evicted from their residence after having failed to pay rent. Subsequently, the now homeless band decided to move into London Bridge Studios in Seattle, the studio where the band had recorded much of their material over the years. The Lollapalooza tour ended that year on August 7th, meaning exactly one month later, September 7th, the newly homeless band had begun recording their next record. The recording session would be the first with new Alice in Chains bassist Mike Inez, which was partly why the band wanted to get into the studio, to see how things would go with Mike. According to drummer Sean Kinney, we did Jar of Flies to see how it was to record with Mike Inez. We just went into the studio with no songs written to check out the chemistry. It all fell into place. As mentioned, though there are some heavier moments on the record, Jar of Flies is largely acoustic based. According to Lane Staley, we just wanted to go into the studio for a few days with our acoustic guitars and see what happened. We never really planned on the music we made at the time to be released, but the record label heard it and they really liked it. For us, it was just the experience of four guys getting together in the studio and making some music. After playing loud music for a year, we'd come home and the last thing we wanted to do was crank up the amps right away. The stuff was written on buses and whenever we had downtime. Alice in Chains are credited as the producer for the record and it was mixed and engineered by Toby Wright. Jerry Cantrell had called Toby Wright during the Lollapalooza tour to see if he'd be interested in collaborating on a record together. Toby Wright was interested, and during the recording session, he put a lot of focus particularly on the sound of Jerry Cantrell's acoustic guitar. In Toby's words, At some points we overdubbed some acoustics with miking those acoustics, but when they were recording live off the floor, I'd use whatever pickups Jerry Cantrell had in his guitars at the time, trying to keep that sound as close to acoustic sounding as possible, so that it sounded like it was an acoustic guitar instead of an electrified acoustic guitar. Toby Wright mixed the record in Los Angeles the following week at Scream Studio from September 17th to 22nd, and as mentioned, the session itself took place earlier from September 7th to 14th. The album cover for Jar of Flies was also shot the week of the recording session. Director and photographer Rocky Shank, who by this point had worked with Alice in Chains multiple times, photographed the album cover on September 8th, 93 in his living room. The title of the album, Jar of Flies, was inspired by a third grade science experiment Jerry Cantrell had. He overfed the flies in one jar, and underfed the flies in another in order to see what would happen. Ultimately, the overfed flies multiplied quickly but then died from overcrowding, whereas the underfed flies managed to survive. This was the inspiration for both the album name and cover art. Photographer Rocky Shank recalls the following. The band had come up with the idea for the title and wanted the cover to be a young boy looking into a jar filled with flies. I remember they asked me to use crazy colors in the shot, so I utilized lots of different gels over the lights to achieve the final look. Upon its release, Jar of Flies entered the Billboard 200 charts at number one, becoming the first ever EP to top the charts. In its first year alone, Jar of Flies sold 2 million 37,853 copies, and it sold an additional million copies after two years. Regarding the success of Jar of Flies, Jerry Cantrell said the following, 
we couldn't believe that it did so well. The success of Jar of Flies showed us that we could do what we liked and that other people would like it too. The record was very well received by fans and critics alike, many of the critical reviews of the EP praising how the band was able to successfully blend various elements from across the spectrum of rock and roll, including elements of blues rock, classic rock, alternative rock, and jangle pop. In total, the EP charts at 30 minutes and 49 seconds. There are seven songs on the EP, Rotten Apple, Nutshell, I Stay Away, No Excuses, Whale and Wasp, Don't Follow, and Swing on This. Three of those songs, No Excuses, I Stay Away, and Don't Follow, were released as singles. Jonathan Plum was an engineering assistant during the recording of Jar of Flies. Here's a clip from an interview I did with him where he recalls a story from that recording session. If you guys like what you see, make sure to subscribe for more. Lots more to come. I remember Lane coming in with his four track. What was the song about, uh, hey... Oh, that's a uh, uh, stay away. I, yeah, stay I, keep, away. I keep I stay away. Yeah. I stay away. Yeah, I yeah, believe yeah. my memory was that Lane showed up with a cassette tape of of those vocals demoed with the harmonies and everything on, that he did at home. That I think he probably just did at home like that day, and he showed up and played it for us. You know, he's playing for Jerry probably. Yeah. So I assume that he had wrote those lyrics and wrote those harmonies. Oh, another another quick memory was yeah. that, you know we didn't talk about Lane his the way that they did harmonies. I mean, because that's one of my my favorite things about Alice is the way yeah, that they the did harmonies, their harmonies. Yeah. And then I think they were they had gotten so good at it, and and Toby, the producer of, that, of Jar Flies, knew too. So Lane would lay down a vocal track, and and Toby would say, "You got a harmony for that?" And Lane was like, "Yeah, hit record." And then Jared Lane would add a harmony, and then Toby would say, "You got another one?" He said, "Yeah, hit record." He had another harmony, and I think. You know, on maybe on that song, we had like a stack of maybe four harmonies that he just went after another after another. And then, and then Toby's like, J Lane was like, yeah, I think that's it. And Toby's like, let's try one more. You got one more? He's like, I don't know. When you roll it. And then it was that fifth one. He'd find that really twisted harmony yeah. that a lot of the Alice has. It has just like that kind of fucked up harmony. And that, that was Lane just finding it on the spot, you know? It was sort of Toby pushing him, saying, "Let's let's just do one." That's so cool. So you said he recorded some stuff on a cassette at home. Did you guys ever use any of those home recordings? No, the, I think we, yeah. those were just like examples. Yeah, we redid everything. Alice in Chains' self-titled record, Alice in Chains, also known as the Dog Record, is the band's third full-length studio record, following Dirt and Facelift. The Dog Record was recorded at various points from April to August of 95 at Bad Animal Studio in Seattle and was released on November 7th, 1995. In keeping consistent with the themes Alice in Chains often explores in their music, the Dog Record focuses on subject matters such as death, depression, drug use, and personal relationships. Alice in Chains has always been considered, rightfully so, one of the heaviest, arguably the heaviest of all the big grunge bands. Much of their music is more metal than it is grunge or alternative, and in specific regards to the dog record, many view it as more of a metal record than a grunge record. Specifically due to the slower tempo of much of the music on the album, the record is sometimes even cited as being partially a doom and sludge metal record. As mentioned, the dog record was released in the fall of 95. A year earlier, in the summer of 94, Alice in Chains was scheduled to go on tour with Metallica, Suicidal Tendencies, Danzig, and Fight. After the release of Jar of Flies in early 94, Lane Staley went to rehab for his heroin addiction. Things seemed to be getting better, but by the summer of 94, when rehearsing for the upcoming tour with Metallica, Lane Staley began using again. This subsequently led to Alice in Chains pulling out of the tour and even going on hiatus. It was during this hiatus that Lane Staley joined Mad Season, while Jerry Cantrell worked on material he had initially planned to use for a solo record. Three of Alice in Chains' four members, Mike Inez, Sean Kinney, and Jerry Cantrell, came together in January of 95 to jam on the material Jerry Cantrell had been working on. Lane Staley reconnected with the band by the spring of that year, and shortly after, in April of 95, Alice in Chains entered Bad Animal Studios with producer Toby Wright. Despite being back in the studio together, all was unfortunately not well. Lane Staley was still using heroin at the time, and as a matter of fact, his addiction was quite severe. Lane Staley would often show up late for rehearsal and recording sessions. Sometimes, he wouldn't show up at all. Susan Silver, one of Alice in Chains' managers, recalls the following. It was a really painful session because it took so long. It was horrifying to see Lane in that condition. Yet, when he was cognizant, he was the sweetest, bright-eyed guy you'd ever want to meet. To be in a meeting with him and have him fall asleep in front of you was gut-wrenching. Despite his worsening condition, Lane Staley wrote the majority of the lyrics for the songs on the album. I just wrote down whatever was on my mind, so a lot of the lyrics are really loose. If you asked me to sing the lyrics to probably any one of them right now, I couldn't do it. I'm not sure what they are because they're still that fresh. This time, there's 
no huge deep meaning in any of the songs. It was just what was going on in my head right then. We had good times and we had bad times. We recorded a few months of being human. In 2018, Jerry Cantrell said the following about the record. There's a sadness to that record. It's the sound of a band falling apart. It was our last studio record with Lane. It's a beautiful record, but it's sad too. It's a little more exploratory, a little bit more meandering. It's not as crafted as the rest of our records were. Now, in terms of the name of the record, the record officially is a self-titled record, Alice in Chains, but informally, it's known as the dog record. Sometimes it's also referred to as tripod, a reference to the fact that the dog on the cover of the album only has three legs. When Sean Kinney was a kid, a three-legged dog named Tripod had chased him around, and that served as the inspiration for the album cover. Frequent Alice in Chains collaborator Rocky Shank did a casting call for three-legged dogs and photographed one at a playground in Los Angeles, but ultimately, the band chose to go with an image of a three-legged dog they had gotten elsewhere. The back cover of the record featured an image of Frank Lentini, a man who had three legs. The record debuted at number one on the Billboard 200 charts and managed to stay on the chart for almost a year. It was on the chart for 46 weeks. To date, the record has sold more than 3 million copies worldwide. One of the common notes from music critics regarding the album is that the dog record showed a progression in Alice in Chains' music, Rolling Stone even calling the album a musical rebirth. The Dog Record is the first full-length record the band recorded with Mike Inez and the last they would record with Lane Staley. The album clocks in at 64 minutes and 48 seconds, featuring a total of 12 songs. One of Alice in Chains' most iconic concerts is their Unplugged performance from April 10, 1996. This concert marks one of the last times Lane Staley ever performed with Alice in Chains. Lane Staley had struggled with drug addiction for years, and by this point in time in 1996, his addiction had progressively been getting worse and worse. In all of 1994 and 95, Alice in Chains had played a total of just seven shows, and the Unplugged performance in 96 was the band's first show of that year. The sparse live performances of the band in these few years had much to do with Lane Staley's worsening condition. Even during the Unplugged performance, Lane Staley was visibly not 100% well, many fans and critics alike taking note of this. However, in a sense, the fact that Lane was not completely well added in a way to the performance. Much of Alice in Chains' music deals with heavy subject matter such as death, drug addiction, and depression. Lane Staley lived that struggle, and we could see that struggle in this performance, which, in a way, gave the concert an extra layer of depth. Now, on a lighter note, one of the cool things about that concert is that Metallica were actually in attendance. Metallica's newest record, Load, would be released on June 4th, 1996, about two months after Alice in Chains' Unplugged performance, which took place on April 10th, 96. At this time in Metallica's history, they had undergone a significant shift in their image and their sound. With specific regards to their image, all of the guys in the band had cut their hair. Alice in Chains and Metallica are friends, so Mike Inez, Alice in Chains bass player, took a friendly jab at the guys in Metallica by writing, Friends don't let friends get friends haircuts on his bass guitar during the Unplugged performance. Jerry Cantrell recalls the following, When we were doing the Unplugged in New York, they all showed up, all four of the guys. They're all sitting in a row, and they all had these new short haircuts and stuff. It was pretty funny. So Mike wrote some stuff on his bass about friends not letting friends get friends haircuts because they were all GQ looking and cleaned up and stuff. Alice in Chains did play a brief tribute to Metallica at the concert, however, when Mike Inez and drummer Sean Kinney played the intro to Enter Sandman just before going into Sludge Factory. Jerry Cantrell also played the beginning of Battery before they started playing Angry Chair. In total, the band played 13 songs from four different records. They played two songs from the Jar of Flies EP, two songs from the Sap EP, four songs from the Dog Record, four songs from Dirt, and a new song that is not featured on any of their studio releases called Killer Is Me. As a matter of fact, the unplugged performance of Killer Is Me was the first time the band had performed that song during a concert. Killer Is Me was actually cut from the MTV broadcast of Unplugged and was later included on the re-release. The band's performances that night of Angry Chair and Frogs were also cut from the MTV broadcast and then later included in the re-release as well. Interestingly, the band did not play one song from their debut record, Facelift, though Jerry Cantrell has said that Alice in Chains did consider playing We Die Young and Got Me Wrong, two songs from Facelift, but eventually decided not to, largely due to limited time. Alice in Chains' set list from the concert goes as follows. Nutshell, Brother, No Excuses, Sludge Factory, Down in a Hole, Angry Chair, Rooster, Got Me Wrong, Heaven Beside You, Wood, Frogs, Over Now, and Killer Is Me. As mentioned, this concert took place on April 10th, 96 in New York. The venue for the performance was the Brooklyn Academy of Music's Majestic Theater. The candles decorating the performance stage were brought by Lane Staley himself. He bought those candles at the famous Pike Place Market in Seattle for this performance. 
I think that in itself is noteworthy because even as a famous person, Lane Staley would still go out to the market and purchase things on his own. Like many in the grunge scene, Lane Staley had a complicated relationship with fame. Despite being famous, many of the people in this scene actually craved a sense of normalcy, to be able to just go out into the real world, so to speak, and do normal everyday things. Lane actually had a very interesting quote about Kurt Cobain regarding how fame took its toll on Kurt. I saw all the suffering that Kurt Cobain went through. I didn't know him real well, but I just saw this real vibrant person turn into a real shy, timid, withdrawn, introverted person who could hardly get a hello out. At the end of the day, or at the end of the party, when everyone goes home, you're stuck with yourself. The performance was first aired on MTV on May 28th, 1996, and was released as a CD on July 30th, 96. This was followed by a VHS release on October 8th, 96, and a DVD version on October 26th, 1999. Going back to the performance itself, as mentioned, Lane was visibly not 100% well during the concert. When Lane Staley died six years later on April 5, 2002, he weighed only 86 pounds. Factor in that Lane Staley was 6 foot 1, that really paints a dark picture of how severe his drug addiction was and the toll it took on him. Despite the tragic way Lane's life came to an end and the years long struggle with addiction that led to that end, one of the characteristics about Lane's personality he's most well known for is his sense of humor. Even during dark times, Lane was known to be a humorous person. At the MTV Unplugged performance, Lane Staley and Jerry Cantrell were bouncing jokes off each other in between songs. Ultimately, the MTV Unplugged performance is one of Alice in Chains' most iconic shows with Lane Staley, and it's also one of their last shows with Lane Staley. Gone too soon, but not forgotten. Thanks for watching, guys. If you like what you see, make sure to subscribe for more. All the videos on this channel are original. I'm the one conducting all the interviews and editing all the videos together. So if you guys like what you see and you want to support, the best way to do so is honestly just to subscribe. Lots more to come.